And uh, our next speaker uh, that you can already start sharing your slides is uh, Professor Andrea Brita Meyer, who is a professor of medicine, healthy aging and dementia research. Uh, she is the co-director of the Center for Healthy A Longevity at the Faculty of Medicine in Singapore. And uh, she will present about uh, shaking up healthcare, uh, healthy longevity medicine. That's great. Um, thank you for, for having me. Um, as a couple of you know, I started at the National University of Singapore one and a half years ago. And what I would like to do today is to present you what kind of structure we, we set up. Because I think in our field of healthy longevity medicine, we need structure to be able to produce good results. Um, and that's the reason why I've never used that, that title, Shaking Up Healthcare. As many know, I'm an internal medicine specialist and geriatrician, and I'm living in the healthcare system, but I think it really needs, uh, needs a shake up. What you see here in the picture is Alexandra Hospital, and that's the hospital where we are starting a longevity clinics and really try to um, implement them in, uh, in whole Singapore in the end. Um, to have a system uh, about longevity medicine, about prevention, targeting aging, you need, as I already said, a framework, but first you need science. And I think that we have enough science to already bring it into clinical practice in a, in a bigger scale. You need diagnostics and you need uh, interventions. So to implement anything, you need first healthcare professionals, consumers, et cetera, to be aligned. And that's the reason why we founded in August of this year, the Healthy Longevity Medicine Society. Um, we, we did that after long lasting discussions to see what aims are, et cetera. And I will show you in a second uh, what it is, but we first started to have white um, of round table discussions to actually see what, what, what is what we do. I know what an internal medicine specialist is doing. I know what an endocrinologist is doing. I know what a surgeon is, is doing. So we defined um, healthy longevity medicine and we defined it as optimizing health span by targeting aging processes across the lifespan. So that is our working definitions, which will be uh, published uh, soon. There is a website, uh, you can see that um, on the right hand side, there is the bottom membership if you're interested. It's really for healthcare professionals, but also for researchers and laymen and other societies, our uh, policymakers are, are welcome. Um, here you see the founders of the Health and Longevity Medicine Society. Um, so you see a range of specialities in their uh, neurology, internal medicine, uh, geriatrics, psychiatry, uh, oncology, uh, et cetera. Uh, what we did in the past months, we had lots of meetings uh, with interested uh, clinician scientists because we have to build the crowd. Not many had ever any lecture during the medical studies or had any education in longevity medicine. So you just see a photo on the right hand side of our network meeting in Singapore we had in September. And now we are uh, around the world to actually bring clinician scientists uh, together or clinicians who are interested to change their, their work. What is this society doing? Um, three main uh, objectives. Uh, that is to educate. I think that's very important. Um, we are educating healthcare professionals, but I must say that I, most of my time I spend in educating also politicians in Singapore, and they are very involved uh, because they are shaping the regulations and that's what we, what we need. And what we also want to do is to get uh, healthy longevity medicine as a recognized speciality into uh, the system of uh, societies, medical societies. And um, not only that, that I can then do my work as a healthy longevity medicine physician, because it's not a recognized uh, speciality uh, yet. I know many of us are using that terminology, but um, I wouldn't say it's fraud, but it's not existing. Um, but it's also very important if you have a speciality, you can train individuals in the regulatory system. So you can train uh, physicians, you can train medical students. And that's the reason why we then have a better chance to also get into, into the curricula. And not only in the curricula of the biology of aging of biologists, uh, but also in the MD curricula. We want to increase quality. 
I think that we are so successful in the field um, that we have lots of output in terms of research that's being translated into a non-regulated um, sector, very often referred to as the um, wellness sector. Um, that, that's not bad, absolutely not. I love innovation. But what I also love is to have standards and, and guidelines where we know what's working, what's not working, and actually to educate individuals where there is evidence and where there is no evidence. And to make that distinction that we can guide consumers, we can guide healthcare professionals, and we can guide also investors. Um, furthermore, and this is most dear to my heart next to the, the guidelines, is to accelerate actually what we are doing. In the first talk, uh, it was mentioned how many trials do we now have and we don't accelerate, I think it will never happen. So we need trial networks, as we already know in uh, other specialities and, and medicine and um, other subjects of, of we, we are working in, they, they all have big networks. And um, there is uh, lots of trials in the hypertension field, endocrinology field and oncology field why lots of continents work together. So we are now building a trial network for the longevity medicine uh, field. If you're interested to be part of that, please uh, let me know, uh, because we are starting that trial network. And the first thing is to standardize, to standardize how we do things, um, how we take blood even, how we um, uh, it, it take uh, uh, biopsies, uh, et cetera, but also how do we measure muscle strength or muscle mass? So it's really about standardization at this moment in time, exchanging processes, and then um, getting funding for our first trials. If you're interested, the first general assembly meeting is at the 14th of uh, December with all our members already. It's a big group already. If you uh, don't want to miss out, please uh, let me know and go to our website and uh, we will invite you. Um, what is the core structure? Uh, and I think that this slide is, is now most dear to my heart because it works with um, uh, big investors and it also works especially with uh, the politicians I'm talking to. We know that the organ performance is uh, declining and there is chronological age on the horizontal axis. At a certain age, you have a chronic disease. And I do, as an internal medicine specialist, I uh, always dichotomize, yes, it's good, it's not good, come again in a, in, a, in, a, in a month's time or sometimes a year time to measure the glucose again in hypertension. And that doesn't work anymore. In Singapore, we are heavily investing uh, in prevention, but what we mean with prevention is rescuing individuals, especially at older age, to have a disease in the end. So what we are doing, we are rescuing a, a patient with a very high glucose level, which is not yet meeting the criteria of having diabetes, and to say, okay, let's do lifestyle approaches. That's not enough. Um, what I realized that I never did in my clinical practice, and that's a little bit an omission, I must say for myself, that if I have a very optimal functional individual at the age of uh, 60 to 80, I never ask that person if this is the optimized uh, function that person have. Because we are very often as clinicians, we say, yes, it's good. It's very good. It's very, very good in the green zone. It's absolutely not abnormal. But what we do not know and we are trying with lots of projects at the moment with sports medicine and um, uh, doctors who are really training this top sporters who are now also doing the football um, in a certain country. Uh, we really try to see, OK, what is the optimal performance of that individual in trying to um, to 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 individualize the interventions? And of course, we have to start much, much earlier. So in our longevity clinic, we are individuals from the age of 30 uh, onwards without any disease. And this is what the Longevity Medicine Society really wants to do, writing guidelines, helping individuals to start these kind of clinics. And I would also say that at least in Singapore, we have a couple of projects where we try to optimize the health of individuals who want to become pregnant, males and females to see if we can optimize the health of the individuals much, much earlier in life and give them a good start. Um, this is our framework in Singapore. Uh, we have a preclinical group uh, led by Brian Kennedy, uh, the clinical group led by myself. Uh, we are starting the, the clinics, bringing it into practice and bringing it into public health. 
um, the public health component is at the moment quite quite big because there's just a very hard push into prevention. We do that with private public partnerships and we do that with certain hospitals and we are now building a hospital group and a network to bring it what is evidence uh, based into practice. And uh, I already mentioned Healthier SG, so that's a preventative uh, program where um, it's quite cost driven. So individuals get a certain budget and they can decide themselves where to spend it on. So you don't have to wait until you have a disease, but you can say, OK, I want to spend the money I get from the government to prevent an age related disease. So here, uh, very good opportunities uh, kick in. We also have a health district at Queenstown. Um, which means that we have an entire sector where uh, 400,000 individuals are living, where especially social housing is. 80% of Singaporeans live in social housing. And um, we are now asked to redesign the entire structure of that, uh, that district and to make it healthier, to stimulate healthier lives, but also to include biomarkers, uh, for example. Um, to, to build that framework further, I already uh, alluded to the Health and Longevity Medicine Society. We are stimulating lots of ed education. I will have a slide in the end uh, where we really focus on the executive ma and masters and crash courses. Um, we built a diagnostic core. Uh, I already mentioned diagnostics is uh, very important and especially the standardization of diagnostics. If you want to compare different studies and especially if you have human material, that um, an outcome A means really outcome A is not B. Um, so we built a core to measure the biological age, not only clocks, but also looking at pathways and targets, and then the intervention core. And I will show you a couple of um, examples what we are doing at the moment in the randomized control trial uh, space. Very important on that point is that everything is standardized, that we can also compare the different randomized control trials and the effect sizes to each other, that these are the building blocks of um, individual interventions that we can in the end combine them uh, very, very soon. This is the framework uh, of what we are doing in terms of intervention and what kind of uh, diagnostics we do. Uh, very importantly, we uh, include a huge amount of clinical phenotyping. So from a few to max to um, a very extensive cognitive screening to uh, measurements imaging, uh, for example, fMRI. We do a, a huge investment at the moment in digital phenotyping. We are always happy to learn. So um, if you want to um, uh, reach out, that would be uh, great. So we have lots of uh, devices. 24-7 uh, measuring the physiology of our uh, randomized controlled trial participants. And of course, we have the multi-omics technology, et cetera, everybody knows in the room. Most importantly, in terms of the intervention that we include the environment, if the noise level where you are sleeping in is bad, I think we will not reunite that, um, uh, that, that body. And at least we are measuring at the moment and how much sun uh, somebody is exposed to and how much noise, um, et cetera. Lifestyle interventions, we are doing really linking them to the hallmarks of aging and doing lots of supplements and new um, repurposed drugs uh, studies. Um, these are the uh, studies we are doing at the moment. Um, what we are doing at the Center for Health and Longevity, we have the pipeline from animal studies of different animal models to uh, the human uh, studies. And uh, once we see an effect in the, in the animals, we will bring it into uh, the human uh, studies. Um, alpha ketoglutarate, I think everybody knows here in the room. I will show you in a second how that works um, or might work. Rapamycin, Rapalox uh, is starting a rapamycin a study, urolicin age, and fibrozole and glycine. The slide is a little bit outdated because we not just um, decided also to do a physitin and a spermidin uh, study in humans because now we have positive results in, um, in the animal uh, models. Uh, you might know uh, alpha ketoglutarate. It's really um, polymorphic in terms of the, the function and then the hallmarks uh, it's, uh, it's touching. Uh, in their ways, it's quite interesting because it might manipulate lots of physiological functions and physiological organ systems in, uh, in humans. And that's depicted uh, here. So all these outcome parameters are being measured, uh, including oral health, uh, et cetera, in our RCTs. And that led to the ABLE study. It's a double uh, blinded randomized controlled trials. We're giving one gram uh, of calcium AKG. We only give one gram because it's really hard to swallow. So I think that's a, a side uh, 
thing uh, we have to um, take care of that people can actually take the supplements. And then six uh, months and three months uh, follow up, 40 to 60 year old healthy individuals. And these healthy individuals, uh, middle aged, have to have a higher biological age measured by um, an epigenet uh, the epigenetic, the methylation uh, clocks. And we are combining different algorithms of these clocks for different and make a composite score out of it because I don't think that we know which epigenetic clock is the best one and the primary outcome is also the epigenetic age. Um, so that's ongoing. Uh, we just uh, finished uh, our study with uh, NMN. Uh, everybody here in the room knows that uh, NED levels go down so the entire idea is while supplementing with NMN that might be a positive effects to um, human longevity, but especially also the functioning of lots of organ uh, systems, um, such as the liver, brain, uh, et cetera. I know that there are lots of study already in the ophthalmology uh, field. We also know I'm involved in, I think, which is, uh, which is great. And they are big, uh, big studies. Um, here is our smaller uh, uh, study I was involved in, 80 men, 50 years of age, no chronic disease, healthy, and a man for 60 uh, days um, in a dose-dependent uh, measure. So there's, of course, a placebo randomized controlled trial, double-blinded, um, as we should do it, 300 milligram, 600 milligram, and 900 milligram. And I only show you a couple of outcome parameters. Uh, first of all, NED levels were higher, which is, I think, important the highest increase uh, around 600 milligram, no much further increase of 900 uh, milligram. Um, and I show you the six minute walking test and uh, especially also the SF36, which is a quality of life uh, marker and uh, a highly established one in all randomized controlled trial of the more conventional uh, medicine type. And what you can see is that uh, people, um, if they are taking 600 milligram or 900 milligram of NMN for 60 uh, days, they have um, a longer walking uh, distance, uh, so which is uh, what we want to see, and they, higher, they report a higher quality of life compared to placebo. So that's encouraging, and that's the reason why we are starting a much bigger uh, trial soon. We uh, prepare at the moment our rapamycin, um, a randomized controlled trial, our longer uh, study. And before we do our trials, uh, we always do systematic reviews. We do that at the moment also for ULIS and A, we did that for AKG. So here you see the results, the first results of our rapamycin a ra a systematic review, uh, where we actually looked at different system, uh, physiological systems on the left-hand side and everything is green, has a positive effect, uh, which is a little bit of yellow, uh, whitish, has no effect, and red is uh, no effect, and the crosses, the red crosses, is not being, being measured. And what you can see is, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, um, uh, we, we have lots of hope for, for rapamycin, and these are, of course, these are just human uh, studies and healthy individuals. Um, it sometimes can be questionable how much effect uh, it has. It has absolutely an effect on the immune system, but that's also the reason why I give uh, rep leprolox and rapamycin to my transplant uh, patients. So it seems to work also in healthy individuals, but I think we will need much, much bigger trials to see what the real effect is on, on healthy longevity. So that's the reason why we are starting the longer uh, study double-blinded randomized controlled trial six milligram uh, of uh, rapamycin per week, uh, three weeks long, and then one week uh, off, and then three weeks again, one week off, um, and uh, three months of follow-up and six months of uh, giving it. Again, in 40 uh, to 60 um, a year old healthy individuals. We really struggled a lot with the primary outcome. I think there's no good primary outcome in our trials yet, but we have chosen um, the CRP and other uh, biological uh, measures. Um, so this is, yes, I think we can diagnose. I haven't shown you the data of our UK biobank analysis, um, but I think we, we all think that there are good clocks already and we have interventions that let that we are starting the longevity medicine clinics in, in Singapore in quarter one, 2023, um, which are publicly funded. I also start with my first longevity clinic privately. Um, in two weeks time, we are opening, which is very exciting in, in Singapore. And we are heavily investing in education. So if uh, you're interested in 2023 in May, we have the first executive program where we are teaching uh, senior managers, bringing a very selective group of senior managers together and uh, um, 
uh, together 2025 is a, is a maximum. It's a little bit the INSEAD of health we are creating. Um, please uh, let me know. Also in 23, in, in April, we have our first summer schools uh, to really be able to uh, educate also the youngsters. And in 2025, we have the first uh, master degrees. Uh, you might also know that we have weekly webinars uh, on Thursdays. Uh, it's very easy to find in U.S. Center for Health and Longevity webinars, and you will find it free of charge, so please be our guest. And thank you for the attention. Uh, happy to have some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea, for this uh, great talk. Uh, I will use uh, my privilege as uh, the chair to ask the first the question something that really inter interests me um, in relation to your talk, but also to a recent paper in the Lancet Health and Longevity, uh, where you defined and uh, the entire WHO working group defines uh, the metrics for, um, for intrinsic capacity, basically the metrics for healthy aging. Uh, so uh, my question is, um, how likely do you think that those metrics, those standards will be used by everybody? I mean, uh, right now, uh, pretty much every researcher has uh, his or her uh, metrics of aging of, of their own. Uh, so uh, that basically depends on their equipment that simply cannot measure anything outside of the equipment. So um, how optimistic um, uh, are you about the dissemination of your, of your uh, standards and uh, what are you going to do to make them more, uh, more consensus, more, uh, more accepted? Now, I'm, I'm a very optimistic person. <laughs> Uh, I know it's hard because I'm a clinician and I, I manage physicians. It's very hard uh, to get them on one line. However, if regulations say that you have to do it in a certain way, people will do it because otherwise uh, it will not be accepted. And I think I don't like that approach because it's a very <laughs> a little bit German approach. You have to do it this way and there's no other way. But I think at least um, we should standardize in a way that we can... Um, we can compare effect size. And I think that's really missing at this moment in time. So I'm very optimistic. If I look at other fields, they also, they standardized approaches, for example, in Europe, um, how you screen for diabetes, how you screen for cardiovascular disease. We have very accepted in um, uh, phase four studies, primary outcomes, which are accepted by the uh, FDA and the EMA. And that's what we need in our field. What do you do with your secondary outcome parameters? I wouldn't care because that can be very explorative, but I think we have to be united in the field. And that's what I try to hope to achieve um, with the society, but, but, but also with the entire network here. Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, time for a couple more questions. Uh, maybe from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, John Ferber, I heard, I saw, yeah, uh, John Ferber, Andrea. Uh, have there been any comparisons of uh, expensive oral NMN versus cheap oral and nicotinic acids uh, niacin? Great question. Uh, we are doing at this moment, I spent a fortune of, of money to buy, uh, I, I can say that we are testing at the moment your listen A and NMN to actually to see uh, what's, it, what's written on the bottle, if inside the bottle. And we also do in vitro uh, tests to look at mechanisms they should target to actually see if they are doing it. Next to that, we're also looking at toxins and, and other ingredients which might be in the bottle, which should not be in the bottle. So watch the space and the RDD next uh, year, we will have all the results um, from not only the testing of the ingredients, but also the in vitro um, uh, experiments for these two. But we will, we will test much, much more. Thank you. And uh, Jose, you can also ask directly if you want, uh, or I can read yes. you can ask. Uh, yes, please. Uh, excellent presentation, Andrea. And um, I am very happy that you are starting with a longevity clinic in Singapore. So how is it different or similar to other longevity clinics like uh, human longevity or uh, fountain uh, life clinics? Yeah, good, good question. I don't, I don't want to advertise my clinic here, but uh, what, you, what you are getting is evidence-based approaches. So um, I, in the, in the past two years, I made recipes where I think, okay, from a clinical um, judgment perspective and academic perspective, this makes sense to do, and there is evidence in humans. So um, I will not uh, prescribe uh, things and drugs. I think the evidence is too weak. And I think that's a little bit the difference from, from other uh, clinics uh, there. In terms of diagnostics, we really try 
to involve everybody who's coming to the clinics also in research that uh, we can say, yes, we, we take the extra blood, you, you get the results of all the omics approaches, which are not yet um, uh, really uh, commonly being used. And um, we give that uh, the results back, not from a medical perspective, of course, uh, in, in Singapore, you really have to be careful. I think around the world about regulatory actions, et cetera, and what you, you sell to, to individuals. So it's, it's all evidence-based. If it's not evidence-based, it's based on, on research. And um, there's uh, lots of enthusiasm to because of that, that safety approach. Okay, thanks. Uh, I think one last question from Leon, also a pretty interesting one. Uh, he, he asked, uh, negative outcomes are more frequent than positive, uh, but they're usually discarded and forgotten. I think taking together negative outcomes could be extremely useful. Do you have a plan to collect uh, uh, the data and report the constructive failures? Yeah, great, great question. Um, being in the field and much more in the translational field and seeing also lots of, um, I don't want to step on anybody's toes, but uh, seeing lots of lab data where you say, okay, I don't know if the experiment really worked. I'm not sure if the mice were really healthy. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. I think what we really need is to be very transparent in what kind of research or what results we have from a human and from an animal, a, a preclinical perspective. I think having something like a database, we don't have to publish every everything, but having respiratory for for data which are which are negative, which somebody else could learn from, would be super important because there is a huge publication bias on on both sides, uh, the preclinical and the clinical side. And I think we are we are really sometimes wasting time and doing experiments again and over and over. And um, another point is let's. Um, power our research well and i think we have to learn also from other specialities our our studies are all too small i think from an animal perspective but but especially also from a human perspective thank you we thank can you very much. <laughs> thank you very much andrea for this talk and discussion